Chapter Three of Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bell saw what he was looking for. Out in the throng of traffic that filled the Avenida do Arc in Rio, he had seen it over the heads of the crowd, which was undersized as most Brazilian crowds are, and he managed to get through the perpetual jam on the mosaic sidewalk and reached the curb. He stood there and regarded the vehicles filling the broad avenue, wearing exactly the indifferent, half-amused air of a tourist with no place in particular to go and a great deal of time in which to go there. Taxis chuffed past, disputing right away with private cars, which were engaged in more disputes with other cars all in the rather extraordinary bad temper and contentiousness which comes to the Latin American when he takes the wheel of an automobile. As if coming to an unimportant decision, Bell raised his hand to an approaching cab. It had two men on the chauffeur's seat, of course. All taxis in Rio carry two men in front. One drives, and the other lights his cigarettes, makes witty comments upon passing ladies, and helps in collecting the fares from recalcitrant passengers. The extra man is called the secretary, and he assists materially in giving an impression of haughty pride. The taxi ground to the curb. The secretary reached behind him indifferently and opened the door. Bell did not glance at him. He stepped inside and settled down languidly. The Bay Ramar, he said listlessly. The taxi started off with a jolt. It was the invariable custom in Rio de Janeiro, and besides, it reminded the passenger that he is merely a customer admitted to the cab on sufferance, and that he must be suitably meek to those who will presently blandly ignore the amount registered by the meter and demand a fare of from eight to twenty-seven times the indicated amount. The cab went shooting down the Avenida do Arc toward the harbor. The Avenida do Arc is officially the Avenida Rio Blanco, and it should be called by that name, only people forget. The Bay Ramar, however, is named with entire propriety. It is actually the edge of the sea, and it is probably one of the two or three most beautiful driveways in the world. The cab whirled past the crowded sidewalks. Incredible numbers of people, with an incredible variation in the shades of their complexions, moved to and from with the peculiar aimlessness of a Brazilian crowd. A stout and pompous Negro politician from Bahia, wearing an orchid in his buttonhole, rubbed elbows with a striking blonde lady of the sidewalk on his left and forced a wizened little silk-hatted parda, approximately an octoroon, to dodge about him in order to progress. A young and languid person, his clothes the very last expiring gasp of fashion, fingered his stick patiently. He wore the painstakingly cultivated expression of bored disillusionment. Your young Brazilian dandy considers aristocratic. It was very probable that he shared a particularly undesirable bedroom with four or five other young men in order to purchase such clothing. But then, Ferenda Fitta, making a picture, is the national Brazilian sport. Bell lighted a cigarette. It was not wise to regard the secretary of this particular taxi too closely. But if his face had been thickly smeared with coal dust, and if he had had a two-weeks beard, and if he had been seen on the forecastle of the Almirante Gomez, one would have deduced him to be a stoker who had not used the name Jameson. The cab reached the Bay Amar and turned to take the long route about the bay. It is one of the most beautiful views to be found anywhere, and tall apartment houses have been built along its whole length to capitalize the scenery. True, the more brightly colored ladies of the capital have established themselves in vast numbers among these apartment houses. 
but in their languid promenades they add, let us say, the beauties of art to those of nature. A voice spoke from the chauffeur's seat. Bell? Right, said Bell, without moving. His eyes flickered, however, and he found the device Jameson had inserted. A speaking tube of sorts, not especially efficient, but inconspicuous enough. He stirred listlessly and got his lips near it. All right to talk, he asked briefly. Shoot, said Jameson, from the secretary's seat beside the chauffeur. This man doesn't understand English, and he thinks I'm in a smuggling gang. He expects to make some money out of me eventually. Bell spoke curtly while the taxi rolled past the Moro da Gloria, with its quaint old church, and went along the winding, really marvelous driveway, past many beaches, with the incredibly blue water beyond. Canaleus is out of town, he said. It isn't known when he'll be back. I met his daughter at a dance at our embassy here, and she told me. We didn't dare talk much, but she's frightened, especially after what happened to Ortiz. I met Riberia, whom Ortiz named. I've been looking him up, growled Jameson through the speaking tube. Bell flicked the ash from his cigarette out the door and went on quietly. He's trying to get friendly with me. I promised to call at his house and have him take me out to the flying field. He has two planes, he tells me. A big amphibian and a two-seater. Uses them for commuting, between Rio and his place back inland. He went out of his way to cultivate me. I think he suspects I'm trying to find out something. Which you are, said Jameson dryly. You found out that Ortiz was right, at least about. Bell nodded and frowned at himself for having nodded. He spoke into the mouthpiece by his head with an expressionless face. He's practically fawned upon by a bunch of important officials and several high-ranking army officers. Suspecting what I do, I think he got hold of a devil of a lot of power. Jameson scowled in a lordly fashion, upon a mere pedestrian who threatened to impede the movement of the taxicab by making it run over him. Ortiz, said Bell quietly, told me he had been poisoned, and treason asked at the price of the antidote. I've heard that the Brazilian Minister of Foreign Affairs went insane six months ago. I heard also that it was homicidal mania, murder madness, and I'm wondering if these people who fawn upon Riberia aren't paying a price for well antidotes or their equivalent. The Minister of Foreign Affairs may have refused. You're improving, said Jameson dryly. The taxi rounded a curve and a vista of sea and sand and royal palms spread out before it. Yes, you're improving. But Artis spoke of Riberia only as a deputy of the Master. Who is the master? God knows, said Bell. He stared languidly out of the window, for all the world to see, a tourist regarding the boasted beauties of the Beira Mar. A deputy, said Jameson, without emotion, of some unknown person, called the master, poisoned Ortiz in Buenos Aires, and Ortiz was an important man in the Argentine. Riberia is merely the deputy of that same unknown master in Rio, and he has generals and state presidents and the big politicians paying court to him. If deputies in two countries that we know of have so much power, how much power has the master? Silence. The taxi chugs steadily past unnoticed beauties and colorings. Rio is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It's like this, said Jameson jerkily. Seven servicemen vanish, and one goes mad. You get two tips that the fate of Ortiz is the fate of the seven men, eight in fact. We find that these two men dispense a certain ghastly poison in two certain cities, at the orders of a man they call the master. We find that those two men wield an astounding lot of power. And we know they're only deputies 
only subordinates of the master. We know also that the servicemen vanished all over the whole continent. Not just in those two cities. How many deputies has the master? What is it all about? He wanted treason of Ortiz, we know. What does he want of the other men his deputies have enslaved? Why did he poison the servicemen? And why, especially why, do two honorable men, officials of two important nations, want to tip off the United States government about the ghastly business? What's it got to do with our nation? Bell flung away his cigarette. The last question has occurred to me, too, he observed, and carefully repressed a slight shiver. I have made a guess, which is probably insane. I'm going to see Riberia this afternoon. He already suspects you know too much, said Jameson, without expression. I am, Bell managed, the ghost of a mirthless smile. I am uncomfortably aware of it and I may need an antidote as badly as Ortiz. If I do, and can't help myself, I'll depend on you. Jameson growled. I simply mean, said Bell very quietly, that I'd really rather not be, uh, left alive if I'm mad. That's all. But Ortiz knew what the matter was with him before he got bad off. I know it's a risk. I'm goose flesh all over but somebody's got to take the risk. The guess I've made may be insane, but if it's right, one or two lives will be cheap enough as a price for the information. Suppose you chaps turn around and take me to Riberia's house. There was a long pause. Then Jameson spoke in Portuguese to his companion. The taxi checked, swerved, and began to retrace its route. You're a junior in the trade, said Jameson painstakingly. I can't order you to do it. Bell fumbled with his cigarette case. The trade doesn't exist, Jameson, he said dryly. And besides, nobody gives orders in the trade. There are only suggestions. Now shut up a while. I want to try to remember some counselor reports I read once from the council at Puerto Pacheco. What? The council there, said Bell, smiling faintly, was an amateur botanist. He filled up his counselor reports with accounts of native Indian medicinal plants and drugs, with copious notes and clinical observations. I had to reprove him severely for taking up space with such matters and not going fully into the exact number of hides, wet and dry, that passed through the markets in his district. His information will be entirely useless in this present emergency, but I'm going to try to remember as much of it as I can. Now, shut up. When the taxi swung off the Bay Ramar to thread its way through many tree-lined streets, it is a misdemeanor, punishable by fine, to cut down a tree in Rio de Janeiro. It carried a young American with the air of an accomplished idler, who had been mildly bored by the incomparable view from the waterside boulevard. When it stopped at the foot of one of the slum-covered moros that dot all Rio, a liveried doorman came out of a splendid residence to ask the visitor his name. The taxi discharged a young American, who seemed to feel the heat in spite of the swift motion of the cab. He wiped off his forehead with his handkerchief, and he was assured that the Senor Riberia had given orders he was to be admitted, night or day. When the taxi drove off, it carried two men on the chauffeur's seat, of whom one had lost temporarily the manner of haughty insolence which is normally inseparable from the secretary of a taxicab chauffeur. But though he wiped his forehead with his handkerchief, Bell actually felt rather cold when he followed his guide through ornately furnished rooms, which seemed innumerable, and was at last left to wait in an especially luxurious salon. There was a pause, a rather long wait, a distinctly long wait. Bell lighted a cigarette and seemed to become mildly bored. He regarded a voluptuous small statuette 
with every appearance of pleased interest. A subtly decadent painting seemed to amuse him considerably. He did not seem to notice that no windows at all were visible, and that shaded lamps lit this room, even in broad daylight. Two servants came in, a footman in livery and a major domo. Your average Carioca servant is either fawning or covertly insolent. These two were obsequious. The footman carried a tray with a bottle, glass, ice, and siphon. The Senor Rabiria announced the major domo obsequiously, begs that the Senor Bell will oblige him by waiting for the shortest of moments until the Senor Rabiria can relieve himself of a business matter. It will be but the shortest of moments. Bell felt a little instinctive chill at sight of the bottle and glasses. Oh, very well, he said idly. You may put the tray there. The footman lifted the siphon expectantly. Bell regarded it indifferently. The wait before the arrival of his drink had been longer than would be required merely for the announcing of a caller and the tending of a tray, especially if such a tray were a custom of the place, and the sending of a single bottle only without inquiry into his preferences. No soda, said Bell. He poured out a drink into the tinier glass. He lifted it toward his lips, hesitated vaguely, and drew out his handkerchief again. He sneezed explosively, and the little drink spilled. He swore irritably, put down the glass, and plied his handkerchief vigorously. A moment later, he was standing up and pouring the drink out afresh from the bottle in one hand to the glass in the other. He uptilted the glass. Get rid of this for me, he said, annoyed, of the handkerchief. He saw a nearly imperceptible glance pass between the footman and the major domo. They retired, and Bell moved about the room exactly like a young man who has been discomfited by the necessity of sneezing before servants. Anywhere else in the world, of course, such a pose would not have been convincing. But your Brazilian not only adopts Fazenda Fita, has his own avocation, but also suspects it to be everybody else's too. And a young Brazilian of the leisure class would be horribly annoyed at being forced to so plebeian an exhibition in public. He moved restlessly about the room, staring at the picture. Presently, he blinked uncertainly and gazed about less definitely. He went rather uncertain to the chair, he had first occupied and sat down. He poured, or seemed to pour, another drink. Again he sneered and looked mortified. He put down the glass with an air of finality. But he looked puzzledly about him. Then he sank back in his chair and gradually seemed to sink into a sort of apathetic indifference. He looked then like a very bored young man on the verge of dozing off. But actually... He was very much alert indeed. He had the feeling of eyes upon him for a while, then that sensation ceased, and he settled himself to wait. And meantime, he felt a particular, peculiar gratitude to the late American consul at Puerto Pacheco for his interest in medicinal plants. The gentleman had gone into the subject with the passionate enthusiasm of the amateur. He described Icarus, Urari, and Timbo. He had particularized on Makaka, Nimbi, and Herva Mora, and he had gone into a wealth of details concerning Yag, on account of its probable value if used in criminology. As counsel at Puerto Pacheco, he was not altogether successful in some ways, but he had invented an entirely original method of experimentation upon those drugs and poisons which did not require to be introduced into the bloodstream. His method was simplicity itself. An alcoholic solution carried a minute quantity of the drug in its vapor. Just as an alcoholic solution carries a minute quantity of perfuming essential oil. 
he inhaled the odor of the alcoholic solution. The effects were immediately strictly temporary and not dangerous. He was enabled to describe the odors, in some cases the tastes, and in a few instances the effects of the substances he listed from personal experience. And Bell had used his method as an unpromising but possible test for a drug in the drink that had been brought him. He inhaled the strangling odor of the spilled liquor on his handkerchief, and there was a drug involved. For an instant he was dizzy, and for an instant he saw the room through a vivid blue haze, and something clicked in his brain and said, It's Yag, and the relief of dealing with something which he knew, if only at second hand, was so enormous that he felt almost weak. Yeg, you see, is an extract from the leaves of a plant which is not yet included in Materia Medica. It has nearly the effect of scopolamine, once famous in connection with twilight sleep, and produces a blaze of blue light, an intolerable sleepiness, and practically all the effects of hypnotism. A person under Yeg as under scopolamine, or hypnosis, will seem to slumber, and yet will obey any order by whomever given. He will answer any question without reserve or any concealment, and on awakening he will remember nothing done under the influence of the potion. The effects are not particularly harmful. Bell, then, sat in apparent half-days, half-slumber, in the salon in which he waited for Ribiria to appear. He knew exactly what he was expected to do. Ribiria wanted to find out what he knew or suspected about Ortiz's death. Ribiria wanted to know many things, and he would believe what Bell told him, because he thought Bell had taken enough yag to be practically an hypnotic subject. Let Ribiria believe what he was told. When he came into the room, bland and smiling, Bell did not stir. He was literally crawling inside with an unspeakable repulsion to the man and the things for which he stood. But he seemed dazed and dull, and when Ribiria began to ask questions, he babbled his answers in a toneless, flat voice. He babbled very satisfactorily in Ribiria's view. When Ribiria shook him roughly by the shoulder, he started, and let his eyes clear. Ribiria was laughing heartily. "'Senor, senor,' said Ribiria jovially, "'my hospitality is at fault. You come to be my guest, and I allow you to be so bored that you drop off to sleep. I was detained for five minutes and came in to find you slumbering.' Bell stared ruefully about him and rubbed his eyes. I did for a fact, he admitted apologetically. I'm sorry. Up late last night, and I was tired. I dropped in to see those planes you suggested I'd be interested in. But I dare say it's late now. Ribiria chuckled again. He was in his late and corpulent forties, and was something of a dandy. If one were capricious, one might object to the thickness of his lips. They suggested sensuality, and there was a shade, a bare shade, more of pigment in his skin than the American passes altogether unquestioned, and his hair was wavy, but he could be a charming host. We'll have a drink, he said bluntly, while the car is coming around to the door, and then go out to the flying field. No drink, said Bell, lifting his hand. I feel squeamish now. I say, haven't you changed the lamps or something? Everything looks blue. That was a lie. Things looked entirely normal to Bell. But he looked about him as if vaguely puzzled. If he had drunk the liquor Riberia had sent him, things would have had a bluish tinge for some time after. But as it was... Riberia chafed him jovially on the way to the flying field and introducing him to flyers and officials of the field, he told with gusto of Bell's falling asleep while waiting for him. A very jolly companion, Ribiria. 
Bell saw two or three men looking at him very queerly, almost sympathetically, and he noticed a little later that a surprising number of the flyers and officials of the airport seemed to be concealing an abject terror of Riberia. One or two of them seemed to hate him as well. End of chapter 3